we start now with the breathing exercises in which way they should be done, whether they're sitting or lying down. We mentioned in the last lecture that there is a difference between breathing exercises and pranayam. They are not the same. And a lot of people who start on the path of yoga, even many yoga teachers, believe that this is the same. But it is not the same. They are two different things. The way this program is um, designed is that we're going to do first in the section basic here. We are going to be doing the parts about the breathing exercises. When we go further down, the line may be four or five sessions down the line, we will be doing <clears throat> the advanced session where we are really talking about pranayam. In the advanced session, um, we will talk about pranayam and uh, the difference. And even though it is advanced in inverted commas, I say, that's okay. You can join in. You, you, you understand some things. You don't understand some things, you know. And you do what, what is possible. Um, Joachim, I got a message from Debbie Lou. She cannot join in. I don't know what you can do to help her. I'm just going to... Um... All right. Yes. I'll, I'll check with her on Facebook. Now. Exactly. Yes. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So I'll just con continue. And so the f first part is about the breathing exercises. And in the breathing exercises, as well as pranayam, which we will do later, can be done either in sitting or in lying down. Now, for beginners or those who are not still able to do advanced pranayam, we recommend seated postures. Seated postures are to be preferred over lying down position. And the reason for this is that a lot of people, while practicing pranayam, fall asleep when lying down. And so we prefer seated postures. Breathing exercises, some of them should always be done in seated postures. We talked about diaphragmatic breathing last time. And that is not a pranayam, that is not even a breathing exercise. It is in fact a practice meant to re-establish natural, spontaneous breathing. Because as I mentioned, you have unlearned it due to our modern, hectic, stressful, anxious lifestyles. We have unlearned it and so we need to re-establish that. So breathing exercise are things like equal breathing, two to one breathing, Bhastrika, Vedjak, all these, um, Kapalbhati, etc. And it is preferred that you sit and do these and not in lying down position. I mean, Bhastrika and Kapalbhati and lying down position would anyway not quite work. So what are some of the postures that we can sit in when we practice breathing exercises? And these are here. I hope you can see that. So that the first one is Maitriyasan or the friendship pose and this is actually a good pose for those who are not flexible enough to sit on the floor in the other poses or those who are older have joint pains 
those who are overweight and are not really able to cross their legs, or have other physical problems or injuries that prevent them from sitting with crossed legs, sitting on the floor on a mat with their legs crossed. The most important criteria here when sitting is straight back. Oops, <laughs> not very good there. It's meant to be straight, no lines there. Yeah. Straight back, the head and the neck are also aligned. This is very important irrespective of which posture you sit in. This is something that needs to be observed in all the seated postures. Another thing is the position of the hands. They should be relaxed and we use Jnana Mudra. I have very often seen pictures which are put out by large yoga organizations, not just here in the West, but also in India. Increasingly, people who want to sell, I don't know, anything these days, and they put a, a beautiful young woman sitting cross-legged, supposedly meditating, and you will see that the fingers point upwards. And here, the fingers are pointing downwards. Now, if you keep your fingers pointing upwards, you will find that you're not completely relaxed. If you keep them pointing downwards, then you can let them relax completely. Simple principle, you know, if you're putting your fingers upwards, they're always against gravity. And when they're downwards, they completely relax. Feet here should be flat on the ground. And therefore, it's a good idea to have a kind of a mat on the ground because otherwise you will get cold feet. The mat that you use should be a, a mat which has a proper insulation in the sense that Something like wool is, is a good idea. It insulates against the cold of the floor, which, for example, cotton would not. Cotton does not really insulate very well. So the choice of the mat should be appropriate. A thick woolen carpet, for example, would be ideal. So this would be a posture for people who are not very comfortable in cross-leg position. The disadvantage of this posture, to sit in this posture, is that you um, obviously will not ever be able to sit in cross-leg position. And, of course, that's not a very good idea. So, you do need to train, eventually, to be able to sit in the cross-legged positions because the cross-legged positions have an advantage. And the advantage of the cross-legged position over these is that the legs are assimilated. What do I mean by that? Here you see the legs, the blood drains downwards. Yeah. And they are away from the trunk from the torso and that is the disadvantage because in a sense your body is spread out it's not collected and assimilated and that is the disadvantage of this so another possibility is to sit in the simpler cross leg position for a while, do the practices in these, in that posture as long as you can. And when you find yourself tiring, or if your knees start paining, 
or your back is hurting, if you find yourself unable to sit any longer in the seated position, then you keep your chair ready, you just move to the chair and you continue doing your breathing practices on the chair in this position. So that would be a compromise. I would suggest doing that only if you really are unable to sit in a cross leg position. So what are the cross leg positions that we have? Oops, I need to erase the lines. Hmm. So the next posture in terms of simplicity is Sukhasan, the easy posture. So now you see again head neck and trunk are aligned in one line and again jhana mudra here arms are relaxed on the knees hands on the knees and legs are crossed once again you have a mat some sort of insulation so that you don't get a cold bottom and find this is a good position. A lot of people who sit in this position for the first time also experience um, discomfort. And the reason is that is in this position, the back is very often not completely aligned. And after a while, you get a little bit of a pain in the lower back. The body is not also perpendicular to the floor. What do I mean by perpendicular to the floor? The body should be straight. This is the floor and this is 90 degrees here. It's not very good, but... And that's how, the, how it should be, that your legs are flat and making this 90 degree angle here. But this is not possible generally in Sukhasan. So the advantage here, of course, over Maitriyasan, over the friendship pose, is that the legs are crossed. They are assimilated towards the torso. But all the same, you are not able to sit very comfortably with your back, neck, trunk, completely at 90 degree perpendicular to the floor or the mat that you're sitting on. Question? Yes? Uh, if, if she was sitting on a uh, cushion underneath yes. the sit bones, yes. would that make, would make it a much more... Yes, yes. Uh, so okay. that would Thank be you. one... Yes, God, that would be one option to use a cushion. A little cushion below um, the bottom is a good prop that one can use Better than a cushion would be taking layers of shawls. You can take thin silk shawls or cotton shawls or woolen shawls, fold them together. And if you take a layer of thinner silk or cotton shawls, the advantage over a thick woolen shawl is that you make a seat out of thin layers. And you have a great advantage. One is you insulate very well. Another is that with time, as you start perfecting this pose, as you sit longer in the pose, you can sort of peel off layer by layer the shawls. You can remove the shawls and you find yourself sitting lower and lower. All the same, this has still another disadvantage and that is that the feet are not locked. What is a foot lock here? You know, the feet are pointing outwards and we need to find a little bit more stability. While the legs are assimilated, they are not assimilated quite enough. So they are going towards the torso, but not quite enough. So there is still another pose which is better than this and we can take that one provided you have already begun to
to master this to a certain extent. If you're a person who is not used to sitting on the floor, you have never done this before, then probably this would be a good posture to start with. Just learning to sit on the floor and you can use a cushion. And so the next one is Svastikasan, the auspicious pose. Now this is a far superior pose to the others. Here, once again, head, neck, trunk, well aligned. You have a foot lock here. Jana Mudra, relaxed arms. And because of the foot lock, the legs are much better assimilated and the foot lock gives a great deal of stability. You see here the knees are almost flat on the ground whereas here they were up, pointing upwards. Here the knees are pointing downwards almost, they're almost flat. And if you would use this position with a cushion or preferably with layers of shawls you would have a very, very good base here. You would create a kind of a triangle here. Where's my pen? Yeah. Can I ask something? Yes, Rimka, go it ahead. Is, it is, yes, thank you. It's, uh, I've tried this pose and yes. it's uncomfortable for mm -hmm. the ankle joints because yes. they are pushing into the bones yes. of the other leg, I think. Yes, Can yes. Can you say something? Yes, you know, Rimka, that <clears throat> is um, one is that what you could do for that is some ankle loosening exercise. Simply, uh, you know, in joints and glands, you know, you turn your ankles, your, your feet around. In standing position, you know, you're just turning your ankles in both directions, your foot in both directions. And if you do that every day a few times, you will increase the flexibility of your ankles. If you sit in Virasan, you know, the thunderbolt position, that will also increase the flexibility of your ankles. Eventually, it is merely a matter of practice. It is uncomfortable initially, and you have to find the, exactly the right place to tuck in your foot there. But with time, you will be okay. So... Initially, if you okay, find, thank you. Yeah, yeah, you, initially you might find it difficult. So if you are already comfortable enough sitting on the floor and, you know, <laughs> people are not overweight, don't have injuries, you know, and um, generally are healthy and can sit on the floor, then it is worth the effort and the trouble <clears throat> to sit in this position because it is, the mo of all of them, the most superior position to sit in. The foot lock may not appear to be a very important thing in the initial stages, but at a much, much, much later stage, it is very useful. And the reason is, eventually, those of you who are aspiring to go really into deep meditation and are genuinely preparing for that, we will come to the part of advanced pranayams. And we also know that those of you who are aspiring for higher states of consciousness, I dare not use the word kundalini, <laughs> but there is no way out of that. If you want to experience the rising of the Kundalini, and let me say very clearly, this is not about um, you know getting into Kundalini yoga and everything that goes around um, the hype around that, but a genuine preparation for Kundalini awakening, which is a sign of an adept. It's a sign of mastery. And if we aspire to be masters, and it is possible if you are well prepared, 
then the footlock is very important because when you begin to get the first little um, signs of Kundalini, what happens is, as you know, the Kundalini is at the base of the, of the spine. You start getting very agitated and the body starts moving or wanting to move. You want to come out of this position. If you are sitting in, if you're sitting here in this position, you get out of it very easily. But if you're sitting in the, with a foot lock, you don't get out of this position very easily. And that is the advantage of this position. It is very steady. And I wanted my pen here. It forms here a triangle. See the, the knees, the two knees, and the base of the spine here. The sushumna here. This here forms a triangle. And that's the, supposed to be the sushumna. <laughs> yeah. Scott, you want to ask one, another question? Yeah. Yeah, uh, also under, uh, under our tradition uh, are also the hills used to engage the Mula and Vanda? That's the next position. Okay. We are coming to that, yeah. Well, I've, I've heard also in this position also as well. No, no, not uh, in this position. No, no. no. Okay, okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Radhika? Yeah, okay. Uh, can I comment on what Rimke said? Sorry? Um, can I comment on what uh, Rimke was asking? Yeah. About, about this um, Bianco problem. Yeah. So that's something I was getting as well, not mm -hmm. so much now. Yeah. Um, and uh, what I found, it also depends on uh, how flexible uh, the rotation is on the knees and the hip. So uh, in some aspects, uh, uh, my legs are flexible, like I can touch my toes, no problem. Uh, but um, in this sitting position, I, I always struggled as well. Mm -hmm. And what I found was because of the way the knees uh, well, they, they don't ra rotate as much as they should, so it just puts too much pressure on the ankles and uh, mm -hmm. um, uh, s sitting on a raised uh, surface like a pillow, uh, that helps a lot. That helps? Uh, yeah, and, and sometimes I start on in this sitting position mm -hmm. and then uh, uh, later on I lower um, well, either my leg, so I'm somewhere between Swastikasana and Sukhasana, right. but it's very comfortable and yeah. in a stable position. Yeah. And sometimes I just start with um, a, a higher sitting surface and then lower it slowly, and then I raise it again. So when mm -hmm. I go back to the raised one, it's I'm already loose on the knees, so it's easier to sit. Yeah. Hmm. It's just, just some experiments. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, that's good. Thanks. Uh, that, that, these are nice uh, little ideas. These are good experiments. A word of caution, though. Um, in the beginning, it's okay if you do this. You know, you sit for a while, then you put your leg out, then you put your leg back in, or you you move to a chair, or you move to simply to sukhasan. In the initial stages, that's okay, because it requires quite some time to build up flexibility to sit in this posture. That is why we do use asanas also to develop flexibility of the body. We don't want to use asanas to, uh, you know, get into gymnastics, get into, uh, you know, kind of competitions and you know, who does more asanas or develop this attitude of, you know, body culture. But the idea of using the asanas to develop flexibility so that one can sit in a good posture and comfortably is very, very, uh, is very important. But a continuous movement 
or changes in the posture are long term not very good. And for the reason for that is that the more you keep shifting, every time you shift, you are actually coming back to the body level. So it is important to develop tapas, tapa, develop the tapas to be able to sit through. It may be uncomfortable. And as I said, if you have prepared before, if you have prepared well in the sense of do joints and glands, do some asanas, which will help flexibility of ankle and knee, you will experience less discomfort. If you skip those asanas or you don't do enough and you want to sit longer periods, you might find yourself torturing yourself and that's not very useful. So to find the right balance is important. To prepare yourself well as well as to have the tapas, to have the determination to sit for longer periods, sit there and go through it, you know, that's, that's important. So we need to find our own balance, okay? Gotham asked, do we sit on the ankle of the lower leg? Sit on the ankle of the lower leg? Yeah, you're, you're not, si yeah, you're kind of sitting on the ankle of the lower leg. You see, let, let me find my, yeah, this, this foot here is tucked in here. This ankle is sort of, you know, poking into your body, if I may put it that way. Similarly, this little thing that you're seeing here, these are the toes. And so that's the foot lock. It's locked in here. You, you actually have to pull your toe your big thumb there, through your thighs and your calves, calves there. And so what happens is that the ankle is down on the floor. Ah, but it is not muladhara, okay? It's not that. It's, it, that's exactly what Scott asked. You're not sitting on it, but your, your ankle is resting on the floor. And that's exactly why... Uh, Rimka also said oh, it's pretty uncomfortable and yes initially it is because you will find your ankle this one here is kind of hitting on the floor this ankle and this this heel is kind of jutting into your body there and it may seem uncomfortable in the beginning it all would get a little better if you sit on um, the layers of and I'm going to just draw them here layers of shawls that you would you know sit on and and then the pressure is not as much on these on the ankle here below and the pressure is not as much on on the leg as well and the pressure then goes more on the knees and of course on the the bottoms okay Does anybody want to ask any more questions to this particular pose or we move on to uh, Siddhasan? Uh, uh, yes, Gautam. Sorry. The question is from Samson about the left and the right legs. That's my question also. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's... Uh, what is the question? Did the, I have to sit in this so that I get it right, first of all. Yeah, the, the right leg is on top and the left leg below. Yes, that's generally how it is. I don't think it would make a difference. It would be the other way around. But that's how the oral tradition is... Um, has, uh, you know, passed it down. I, there is no particular logic to it. I have done it also in the opposite way and I have found no difference to it. This was just one of my scientific experiments. But I would stick to what the oral tradition has taught. Okay, where do we have to spread the silk shawls? Well, um, one is the mat that you're sitting on, of course. 
and you could use a thick blanket or you could use a thick blanket and cover a silk shawl over it but what I meant was to take a number of silk shawls fold them together to make a seat and then you actually sit on it and your knees would rest here on this mat Mm -hmm. And for Patricia, for beginners uh, in Sukhasan, you can use, um, here we go, oops, I need to erase this, in Sukhasan you could put some, um, some sort of, uh, you know, roll up a blanket or so or a pillow, and you can put it here underneath. But um, as I said, all these props are only short term. All the ideas only short term. What I find, however, very often that, I mean, if you're talking about uh, yoga classes where people just come once a week or so, um, that they tend to just continue with that over longer periods of time and then I would say for this person is better focus on asanas to increase flexibility in the meantime sit in friendship pose on the chair but you need to try it out you need to try out both you know see what works better you can sit in this position with a blanket or cushion underneath for support or you sit in friendship pose and, and at the same time teach asanas or do practice asanas that increase flexibility. Very often the people cannot sit in these positions because they're overweight, you know, and that problem cannot be solved by flexibility. That can be only solved by losing weight and for that you need a change in lifestyle. Okay. So... Uh, Swastikasana and Padmasana, Svarnalata are not the same. Swastikasana is totally different. Padmasana, in Padmasana this leg would also be up. The lower leg here, what you see, would also be up, you know. With both the ankles sort of uh, protruding uh, into your torso. Padmasana is not recommended. Padmasan is a symbol of yoga. Padma, lotus, is the symbol of yoga. So you see in ancient sculptures, paintings, that uh, people, you know, yogis, very often you will see Buddha, you will see sculptures of Mahavir, paintings of uh, different yogis sitting in Padmasan. It's not that they were really sitting in Padmasan. It is a symbol of yoga. If you sit in Padmasana for a very long time, it's excruciatingly uncomfortable and um, it's not a very useful thing for meditation. Adepts do not sit in Padmasana. They sit in Siddhasana. And Siddhasana is here. Okay, it looks pretty much the same as Vastikarsan. The only difference here is that now, that's what Gautam asked, that's what Scott asked, you are sitting on, literally sitting on the ankle, um, on the heel, heel, not ankle, on the heel and the ankle, yes. And that position is only suitable to those who have attained a high level of flexibility as well as it seems to be a good better position for men than for women and for obvious reasons women have delicate tissue there and therefore would find it uncomfortable for a longer period of time to sit in this position and men can sit longer in it with the ankle on the muladhara chakra there, pressing on it 
the mula bandha, that is a lock, that's another lock. I don't want to give the impression that, um, you know, the men have an advantage in any way. I have not found this to be true. Siddharsan or Swastikarsan, both are equally good. You will find that if you keep doing this, your body takes you very naturally, let me go back to Sukhasana, your body, as it becomes more and more flexible, goes naturally from Sukhasana. After a while, you will find that it's not comfortable enough and your body will adjust. And it will very naturally adjust into Svastikasana. When you have sat long enough in Svastikasana <clears throat> and you've removed some of those silk shawls from under your bottoms, you will find very naturally yourself going into Svastikasana. Okay? So this is something that we should not try to force upon ourselves. I have met, I have students and I have met people who force themselves to sit in this position. What happens when they do that? The body is very tensed. The muscles of the back are totally strained. The hip muscles are totally strained and tense. The arms naturally get also strained, the shoulders get strained, everything is tense. You, it's impossible to meditate in such a position if your entire body is totally tensed. So don't be too bothered about, oh, this is a more advanced position and I want to be in that. Focus on the comfort. Can you sit for longer periods? in this position? If the answer is no, then go a step back. Can you sit for a longer time in this position? If yes, then continue to sit in this position. And the answer is no, then go back. If you're comfortable, great. If you're not using too many props and things like that, you're comfortable, you can sit for a longer period of time, wonderful. If not, go right back to friendship pose and focus on asanas, joints and glands. Build up your flexibility so that you can sit for longer periods of time. What happens frequently uh, is that everybody is very ambitious and they want to skip, fits, you know, skip all these steps and just go to, you know, to the next one. And so, Gautam, when I say longer period of time, I mean that you should be able to, depends on your practice, of course, uh, I, I don't know you, but we have a program here and I guide um, my students. And of course, we have a fairly long uh, practice that, that we do and, and in our tradition, we encourage people to sit for longer periods of time. And when I say longer periods of time, if I take the whole practice into consideration, not everybody is sitting every day for that much time, but the ideal time then would be, you know, about 15 minutes in a uh, little bit of meditation, uh, contemplation, another maybe half an hour or so in pranayams, uh, another half an hour to one hour in deeper meditation. So, you know, you can have up to two hours of sitting. And that's what I mean by longer periods. And I know that most of you are not doing this. This is for those who are in the mentoring program. But even for those who are not sitting for such long periods, if you do aspire to attain higher levels of meditation, if that is why you're doing this, then you should work with the fundamentals. Start with the basics. Skipping steps 
is like going two steps forward and, you know, oh, sorry, one step forward and two steps back. So that is not very helpful. But for those of you who, who just want to do a little bit um, for your well-being, you know, just, just to keep stress out of your life, want to lead a stress-free life, then it's totally fine for you to sit in Maitri pose or in Sukhasan for a short period of time. But if you really aspire for deeper meditation, then do it systematically until you are able to sit very comfortably in Swastik Asan for up to one or two hours. And only when you can do that, and if you can do that, actually it will happen quite naturally, spontaneously, on its own, that you will be able to sit here in Siddhasan. Okay? So don't skip the steps. Don't get too ambitious. Go step by step. And things start happening naturally, on its own. You will find that if you do it step by step, within a few months, within three to four months of practicing asanas and joints and glands, you will be able to sit comfortably in cross leg position in Sukhasan. If you maintain that position for another few months, maybe with a few props if, if you want, you'll be able to sit in Svastik Asan. And if you can sit in Svastik Asan for a year or two years, very comfortably, very naturally, you will attain Siddhasa. Okay? We're talking about long-term practice that's sustained over years. It's for those who really want to go deeper into this. Okay, so that was about the seated positions. If there are no more questions about that, then we can move on to the next bit. So I mentioned already the different postures and Jana Mudra, the criteria for sitting, which was sitting with the back straight, head, neck, trunk aligned and the legs and arms assimilated. So what is the best posture for me? I think I already elaborated on that. The best posture to start with is the posture that you're most comfortable in. And simultaneously practice asanas that build up your flexibility so that you can then aspire for the next posture. So we go to the next part, which is about pranayam. It's more a general part on pranayam. And so, first of all, we should be clear that pranayama is different from breathing exercises, and that prana and breath are also two different things. So one is prana yama, prana ayama. Prana means breath, and yama is the control of the pause. Now, I think breath in this case is used uh, in a general way. It, it actually means energy, or prana means the first unit of life. Prana is life itself. You know, in India, colloquially, the word prana is used, pran is used for life. The word pran is used to mean life. You know, I lose my life, you say, I lose my prana. I'm dying, you know, I lose my prana, you say. So, prana is life itself. And yama is control. Now, I have specified your control of pause. You're going to 
to elaborate on that in the preceding, preceding chapters, which will be um, in a couple of uh, sessions down the line, because this is a very important thing that one needs to understand. Control of breath does not mean kumbhaka, you know, um, forced uh, kumbhaka for, uh, for people who are doing that, coming from very, some very different traditions, uh, is a very, very um, violent practice to retain the breath or to exhale and hold the breath. Either way, this is very, very harmful. The body goes under a tremendous amount of strain and stress. It's not relaxed. And that's not what is meant by control of breath. Control of breath also doesn't mean having a really long exhalation or inhalation. Control of breath means no pause. That there is no pause, omitting the pause. We will elaborate on that in the chapters to come, in the sessions to come. But for now, we will see what is the difference between pranayama and breathing exercises. And that we will let, I, I hope that it's going to be clear. I, I know that sometimes the sound is not very clear or the uh, screen seems to freeze. But we're going to try it out all the same and, and I hope that uh, you can hear, at least hear, if, if not see the screen or even if the screen freezes. You will hear what he says. What is the difference between pranayama and breathing exercises? Pra means first. Na means unit. First unit of energy which is already within you. How it is charged by breath, through breathing. That is pranayama. Yama means control. Prana means the vehicles that supply energy. How to control these vehicles so that they are regulated? Breathing exercises are different. They are superficial. They are important. But they are superficial. They are not called pranayama. They prepare you to do pranayama. Pranayama are the deeper, deeper exercises. They can be mentally. Through pranayama you can apply shushumna. Through breathing you cannot. That's the difference. Through pranayama you can have kumbhaka a long time. The human beings have immense potentials. No limit. So, no, shortest. I hope everybody was able to hear that, that there was no issue with the sound. Anybody wants to ask anything it's about that? Clear. Sorry? It's quite clear. Okay. There's no problem. Good, good. Okay, excellent. The... Next one is, what's the difference between breath and prana? Nikopio. After you have understood your antakarna, you go and try to understand the final body within you, finest body within you. According to Munda Kuprishad, what you call prana is not prana. They are not called prana. They are called vehicle. Vehicle which take pranas inside. 
prana, pana, vyana, udana, samana, this. There are many, many vehicles, they do their work separately. What is prana? The first unit of life is called prana, and now this is body, breath, mind, conscious mind, and conscious mind. And here is the center of consciousness from where all power comes. So first unit is called prana. Prana is not here actually, it's here. Only one scripture, there are many other scriptures, but one Upanishad explains it, that's called Munda Upanishad. We have taught that. Because of prana, the mind moves, mind functions. Who motivates mind to function? It's the Munda Upanishad talks about this prana. This Adi prana, this Adi prana. This Adi prana. This Shakti, Devatma Shakti, as Swet Upanishad says, is called Kundalini. Kundalini Shakti. At present, it's in a latent state. You do not know. You think it's prana. It is called prana, actual prana. Prana means very life, the source of life, the source of all creation. Okay, so those were two um, nice little clips. They are on our chat channel. For those of you who don't know the channel, that's the that first English, because there's also a that first German channel. So there's now already 66 uh, little clips and videos on the channel and this year we are planning to upload at least another 100 more. So um, if you haven't subscribed then that might be useful if you enjoy this kind of stuff. So to... Just explain what he was saying there, because he didn't really draw the diagram really properly over there in that particular clip. But this is what he was explaining. We have gone through this many times, I know that. But this is also for those who are joining the first time, as well as a good revision. I have been looking at this for by 25 years and uh, I never get tired of it. This is really the map of the world, of the universe. Here, the world, the senses that perceive the world, the body. This is the breath and this is where you do breathing exercises. So at this point, no, sorry, <laughs> that doesn't work, does it? So that's where you do breathing exercises at this point here. Then you have the conscious mind, the active and latent, and this is the center of consciousness. And here, this is Adiprana. So you're doing breathing exercises at this point here. You're using your nostrils, you know, your breath. And that's the bridge between the body, the senses, and the conscious and the unconscious mind. The breath here is one of the few instruments or handles that we have to influence the unconscious mind and the involuntary nervous system. You see, we have many involuntary parts of our nervous system that we cannot influence. So the heart, for example, is involuntary. It just keeps beating. You know, you, you don't do anything to increase or decrease your heart rate. You know, when you're uh, getting worried or 
upset, you know, you don't increase your heart rate uh, through your willpower. You don't think, okay, now I need to increase my heart rate. It just happens. And then there are many, many other involuntary systems, you know, circulation and digestion and everything, which is just happening. You have no control over it. Breathing, the breath, is one of the only one which is both voluntary as well as involuntary. So you're breathing all the time. You don't know it. You're not aware of it. It's happening. You don't have to think, oh, I need to breathe now. It happens. At the same time, you can control it if you want to. So the breath is unique because it can be used, therefore, to gain control of the involuntary nervous system. And through that, to the involuntary or the deeper aspects of the mind. Now that is different from Adiprana, which is right here. You see, it is deep, very deep, buried inside. It is life itself, which is what he called Kundalini Shakti. And that's what we talk about when we talk about Pranayama. So most of us are not doing Pranayama, we are doing breathing exercises. And when we talk about mastering pranayama, talking about first working on the basics with the breathing practices and developing these until you come to the point where you are able to work at this level. And to answer your question, Aranka, Adiprana and Kundalini Shakti are indeed one and the same. <laughs> yes. So, when you go to, you know, there are a lot of people who sell seminars on Kundalini and, uh, and Pranayama, etc. And then they do basically a lot of breathing practices at this level. They're not teaching you anything actually at this level. Because you cannot do anything at this level unless you have passed this. So, you have to go right up to here. Only when you come to this point, you can start working at the level of prana. Before that, you're working only at the level of the breath. Most of us are identified with our senses. Some are even identified with the worldly objects here. You know, you think you're your car. If somebody tells you that your house looks crappy, you get very, very upset. Well, why do you get upset if somebody tells you your house looks awful? Or why do you get upset if somebody tells you your, you, you look, you know, your clothes look shabby? Why do you get upset? Why do you, why do you feel great if you get a new car and everybody says, hey, you've got a cool car? because you are identifying with those objects. So, if you are identified with worldly objects, don't think that you're gonna to go to a seminar and suddenly you're gonna be doing wonderful prana practices at the level of adiprana, essentially working at the level of kundalini. That's not gonna happen. There are some people who have unconsciously activated their kundalini. These are very, very creative people, you know, all great creative people who, who write wonderful books and poetry and, and art and, and music and, you know, amazing stuff. They have unconsciously raised their kundalini. So they are experiencing the benefits or the powers of this kundalini. Those who are very successful in life and you ask them, and how, 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 how do they have so much energy? And you wonder, this person, he loves his work and he's working for like 14 hours a day and doesn't seem to tire. And there are a few people like that who are very motivated and they enjoy their work and they're very passionate about their work and they feel wonderful. They, 
they're not forcing themselves to work, they love it. These are the people who have unconsciously raised their kundalini. But most of us are right here or at the level of the senses, the level of the body, and we can't jump from here to there. Did you want to say something, Scott? <laughs> yes, but I'm trying to resist. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Don't have to resist. Let it out. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I just, I mean, obviously, when those people, oftentimes they're successful on one level, but if they're not aware of their clashes, then they're often compensating in some other area. Sometimes they're, that's why they also have other problems in their life. Yeah. Where they, a little craziness, you know, other parts. Maybe they manifest kundalini in one area, but another area of their life is all crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. I absolutely so, agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. That's why I said it's unconscious. They have had the access and they have tapped the energy of kundalini, but only a little bit of it. And already that little bit makes, you know, them bubbling with this creative energy. But, very true what you said, in other areas, they have to deal with their pleasures. They have to deal with their, the colorings. And they do have the usual problems that everybody else does as well. Dealing with their negative qualities and, you know, going through the, 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 the envy, the, the jealousies, the, the anger, the... Yeah, greed, etc., you know, ambition, all these things that that make up our human life. Indeed, that's true. They're not yogis. They're not people who have worked with their pleasures. They have not purified their conscious and unconscious mind. But unconsciously, they have tapped some energy from here. So there's no way that that they're going to experience pranayama systematically. No, that's not what I meant. Just unconsciously, they're able to tap into that energy from there. But put them in into a state of meditation, ask them to sit down and meditate, they are not able to do that. Because they struggle. They struggle with their own body, they struggle with their senses. They struggle with all these things. Very often, they also have very strong egos. Hankara is very, very strong in such people. So Aranka says, how do we get there? Oh, Aranka, how do we get there? Yeah, you see the path here, it's marked out. <laughs> That's how you get there. <laughs> you first work at the level of senses. <laughs> what do you mean by next time? Next life or what? <laughs> no, I mean, it's probably time now. It's maybe a, a, a quite a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Most, ta most of the times we are identified as senses. And then if you don't, are not able to observe your senses, how will you observe your thoughts? You know, you, if you don't observe your own actions, it's very hard to observe the thoughts. The thoughts are even subtler. So how do you get there? Okay, you need a systematic practice. You need guidance, you need systematic practice, which includes asanas, breathing, Learning meditation, very important. Um, very important um, practices, Atma Vichara, mastering these things. And going layer by layer through the conscious and unconscious mind. We are talking about it very often on Fridays in the Bhagavad Gita sessions that... It's one of the toughest things to do because you're looking at your own very unpleasant negative qualities and learning to attenuate these. And that's not what everybody wants to do. So what happens is that it's only those who are really determined, who are willing to organize their lives, they manage to do that. They organize their lives so that they make this the priority number one. And then you can do that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So it is not actually not something that you, I mean, I thought, I thought that I was practicing pranayama every day. Mm. But if I now hear your story, mm. I think I don't do that. No, probably not. <laughs> I don't know, but <laughs> no, pranayama is probably something that that like like for example when you think that you're meditating but you are still trying to concentrate. Yeah. Yes. Um, probably pranayama is also something that that you need to develop. Yes. Very true. It's something that 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 you can do instantly. No. Like breathing. No, no, exactly. It, breathing, exactly. Very well put. Breathing you can do instantly. Everybody can do it. But pranayama, yeah. not everybody can do that. For that you need really preparation. And I can share with you that I've been doing this for over 25 years. I mean, I have been doing most of these things since I was a child. But very systematically since over 25 years now. And I very honestly tell you that it's... It's taken decades. It really has taken decades to be able to say with complete honesty that I'm able now to do some pranayama. <laughs> Before that, I was wow. not. <laughs> That's really amazing. Yeah. So uh, anybody who wants to do this should come, uh, you know, with the idea. This is a long-term thing. This is not a quick fix, you know. It's gonna take time. So that's something that we need to be clear about. That's where Shraddha and Sankalpa Shakti come in. Exactly, that's exactly. Um, most people, they just give up and they say, oh, this is too complicated, or I don't understand this, or this is just taking too long, or I'm doing the wrong things, or, or I'm a bad person, <laughs> or something like that, and they stop. Instead, one just has to plod along and it sometimes seems to be very slow and sometimes you feel you're stuck and sometimes you feel that you're even going backwards. But you're not. Everything that you do in this journey, the internal journey, everything that you do is saved. <laughs> you know, on your laptop, if you don't, don't, don't save stuff, you, you can lose documents and stuff. Well, this has got an autosave, you know, on this, this part, you've got autosave, and it just keeps saving everything. Everything is saved all the time. And so it carries forward to your next life. You don't lose anything. Never. You will never lose it. You can lose everything when you die. You know, you, unless you, you're not even one of the pharaohs who, who took their wealth along with them. Even they couldn't take it along. The tomb robbers stole all of the gold. But this you can take along. This is the real gold that you can take along. Everything that you do has an, leaves an impression in the unconscious mind here. And you take it with you. So whatever practice you do, it helps. So just keep going, just keep going. Just keep going. Matthias, which pranayam practice can help to purify the three lower chakras or burn the barrier between Manipura and Anahat? Well, I don't know if you're going to like my answer, Matthias, but I'm going to tell you what I know to be true. You're just using the word pranayam, and I just said that you are not doing pranayam. You are doing breathing exercises. I mean, I don't know you personally and I don't know what the details of your practice, but irrespective of what details are, the chances are you're doing breathing exercises. With breathing exercises, you don't burn up the barrier between Manipura and Anath. You, you cannot purify the, uh, the chakras. Breathing exercises will help you to calm down your nervous system and prepare you for meditation, which is here. And it is purification here at the conscious mind as well as the unconscious mind here. At these two levels, when you purify here, you are purifying your chakras. 
That's what chakra purification means. When you start attenuating kleshas, the colorings, that's what is real purification. So you can keep breathing as many hours as you want and keep doing all sorts of complicated exercises. You're not going to purify chakras with that. Okay? All right. So I think that um, we should stop here. I didn't even realize that we already quarter past uh, our time. So we will stop here and continue next time with uh, where we left off. So next time we continue with uh, the, the main part, the seven step program. Okay. Good. It was nice having everybody enjoy the whatever is left of your Sunday and see you, most of you, I guess, on Friday for Bhagavad Gita. Have a nice time. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad Bye. you enjoyed. Bye.